Great. Thanks. Um, it's always being the first speaker is always a bit nervous, so let me go ahead. So let me start off by saying um, this is more of a hobby or more of a kind of a side hustle to, to what I do in my day job. It comes back to a lifelong love for maps, particularly topographic maps. Um, when I was a kid, I would do anything to buy a topographic map, the old NZMS 1 series or anything like that. Other kids were sports, sports stars or, or things like that. But over the years, I started collecting maps and of course now, with digital transformation, we're getting all sorts of digital maps and, and, and things like that. But I always found it's really difficult to find these maps. And is that feedback? Um, so, uh, over the years, I was looking at better ways to be able to manage and, and, and find maps. And it was a particular frustration when I started working with people um, to find and identify maps, particularly maps outside our normal sort of area in New Zealand. For example, military maps, World War II maps, um, maps of the Pacific and, and things like that. So this is kind of where all this all comes from. I should also state I'm not a developer. I know very little about developers. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hacker. So um, just, just bear, bear in that in mind if you've got some really technical um, questions. So I'll start off, um, probably the first one, I just want to give a quick tribute to Igor. So Igor was really instrumental in setting up the original historic map library. I'm sure most of you know that who, who are here from New Zealand. Um, unfortunately, he passed away earlier this year. Um, he was the map curator at the National Library and we've been working together over the last 10 years on ideas like this. and and. Our last conversation was late last year about using this to implement um, sort of thing. So I just wanted to say that a lot of this is not my original ideas, but but discussions with with um, Eagle. So what's the problem? Multiple um, offline indexes scattered around the world. Nothing's federated. Nothing's joined together. Various formats and various de degrees of information. There's really no simple way to search or or um, more than one repository at one time. Um, most are text-based, not map-centric. Most of us are geospatial or, or GIS people or, or, or geographers. And so we, we think about maps and how we search and, and you know, and, and geospatial thing. Then the other thing, a lot were really difficult to download. Some, some archives have done really good jobs of scanning high-resolution TIFFs, but they're a gigabyte. So then you've got to download it and then find a piece of software to, to open it and, and view it. Um, in my mind, the discovery of, discovery of GIS data is broken. It, it's overly complicated and incomplete. Organizations spend time and money on creation and acquisition of data, yet it still sits on hard drives, DVDs, shelves, and web catalogs without a straightforward way to um, discover it. Discovery tools do exist. I know we're going to have a couple of talks later on um, over these sessions around some, some of the tools that have been implemented in the Pacific and other places around that. Um, but often it's, it's an afterthought um, around um, how this all puts together. Um, so I start off by saying, you know, you know, if you put these maps up here, there's just five maps come off the top of my head. But you know, how easy are these to find? For me, I, I can find them reasonably quickly. But for a lot of people, it'd be quite difficult. This one here, for example, is Panama. Now, Panama's actually got an open data repository for the one with 25,000 sheets, GeoPDFs. But you've got to speak Spanish, and it's actually really hard to find. You've got to sign up to a, a web thing and go for it. Some of these World War II maps, uh, uh, Bougainville, for example, they're all sitting in these disparate, um, disparate um, repositories and uh, down there. So in my mind, I had to think about um, you know, the other things, editions, which is the current edition? You download a map, do you want the current edition or do you want to look at change? Do you want previous editions of the same map? For example, in New Zealand, we've got the Linz Topo series. Linz have been fantastic at updating their maps. Some maps get updated yearly. So how do you know which map you want to look at and, you know, when it's relevant to your research or what you're trying to do? So what's the solution? So the, the solution I've kind of been working on is, is Based on a um, based on some uh, open source um, software, and it's been wrapped up into a package called Geo Blacklight. Um, simple, seamless, um, scalable web interface makes it really easy to search and find. Um, it allows you to harvest and update the metadata seamlessly. More importantly to me, it's a map centric um, map centric search, so you can use the map as your primary search interface. 
um, curated index. It means you can curate the index and um, and make additions as and when needed. Um, so GeoBlackLight has been adopted within the academic library community, particularly in the US. There's about 10 or 12 um, academic libraries who've been actively developing and using this. I think the other important part of this is it's completely scalable. Being um, based on um, various web technologies, that allows us to expand, um, expand very um, quickly. And as I mentioned, it's um, open source. So, of course, being open source, it supports OGC web services, WMS, WMTS, WFS, and I'm sure you all know all these acronyms, but I can step through it. Supports proprietary formats as well. Um, the one that interests me is the IIF um, manifest format, and I'll, I'll step through that in a second and why I think that's important. It allows you to have different types of downloads, and I'll, I'll demonstrate how that works. And the mapping framework's based on Leaflet, so there's all these extensions in Leaflet that you can add and build on to do it, so it makes it um, much easier to um, work. So the platform itself, it's a Ruby, Ruby, Ruby on Rails app, uses Apache Solar um, uh, for the search and database and Blacklight to assist with that. Um, what I've done is I've had a, a, built a Docker image and then I've loaded that Docker image into um, AWS and I can run it locally as well. And again, that's all about um, Open software makes it easy to develop, makes it easy for other people to contribute to it, and um, I say it's really easy to fix. I don't do a lot of the fixing. I work with other people who are a lot smarter than I am to, to do that part of it. So that's the platform. Probably the, the secret source of the key part of it is the metadata, and that's um, what ties all this together. Now, of course, we know there's, there's multiple metadata standards around the world in different countries and different organizations and, and different people implement metadata, and of course, that's if they implement metadata. A lot of data that you find has no metadata at all, so you have no real idea of how to um, implement and, and, and use it. So as a parallel to the development of GeoBlacklight, the, this group of academic libraries in the US has created this schema called, called Aardvark. And this schema is a, it is, slightly focused on a, on, a, on, a, on a library librarian's kind of view of metadata, but it's a really great way to be able to bring metadata from different sources into, into one area. And I'll step through that if I can. Um, let's see if this works. So to give you a bit of an idea here, I don't know, is that coming up on the screen? So to give you a bit of an idea here, all, all we're showing here is, that is, is, for example, looking at the, everybody, most people here are familiar with the lens maps. All I'm showing here is, you know, you have a library. In this case, it's the, it's the University of Auckland Library. There's a publisher, there's a series, there's a sheet edition format. And then so we have these metadata tags that allow us to manage that through different series um, and then different editions and things like that. But because it's open and publishable, it makes it really easy to bring in um, from other different sources. And it also means it's harvestable. And that data just sits um, for a singular, singular file. I don't know whether that pops up to give you a bit of an idea there. It's, it's, just, it's just a JSON file. So you can see, the, you can see the, the metadata tags, and that allows you to, you know, you can create this, this metadata file for each, each um, object or, or, or map. Or um, things like that um, on there. Um, what else? I don't think this gives you just another view of the flow of the of what I call the tag flow. Again, coming from a um, from the provider to the publisher to the series, and then you've got the 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 map itself. But then you've got the multiple. Um, um, additions. So furthermore to it, it's, it's, it allows you to look at what's the current version, how did that map get replaced, um, what's it replaced with, and again, I'll show you in a second, and it, it, it's, it's quite, quite ingenious in the way that it allows you to work through that flow to understand the, um, the maps. So, 
Um, so there's the, oh yeah, if I can show you the schema. So um, again, it's, it's a published schema. Again, there's some rules around how you, how you set that up. Um, there's already FME scripts, there's already um, Python scripts that allow people to work with um, the, the metadata there. I can quickly show the, um, hopefully I've got it up here. So I'll just go for a, a, an example. Um, Publish is probably a good one. So again, steps through um, for publisher, steps through, tells you what to expect, the type of field type, the purpose, and, and again, it, it gives a person quite a detailed view on what, what the expectation is, is filling that, um, that data up. So what I'll do now is I'll show you the, the basically the, the visualization. I'll, I'll jump through and spend a couple minutes and show you how it all works, and hopefully the, we've got. So basically, you have a you have an entry screen like this. Um, or, or at the moment, all I've done this is just a, a dev setup, and I've just I've just loaded in some topographic maps of Northland of um, New Zealand. We can, for example, we could just decide to go here, click search, and theoretically it should bring up um, some maps, and then we can click. And as you see, um, as you run down, we we can step out a little bit. Um, as you run down, you can see the different bounds of the maps and things like that. So we can bring one of those maps up. We'll bring one of those up. And then say you have a each each map or each object has its own page or its own own um, set of metadata. So I think the first part, and I talked about the IIF before. So um, I've forgotten what IIF stands for, but it's just a way to be able to zoom maps that aren't georeferenced. So if you have georeference maps, you can create a WMTS, WMTS service or a WMS or, or a TMS. But for maps that aren't georeferenced, you know, you sh people still want to do it. You don't want to have to download it, then find, open it, and this or open it. Try and do it. The whole idea is to have a zoomable, zoomable viewer within your um, within your browser. So in this particular case, um, anybody been to Cape Ranga recently? So this is, this allows you to burn, and we can click on there too to get a better view. So this allows on your desktop to. So what we've done is we've identified the map, we found the map we want, we can view and and have a look at it, and 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 um, do what we want with it. Um, on the site here, for example, if, if you're using this for search, you can um, there's some information there to allow you to cite the map. Um, this is hooked into the Lens metadata for the. Um, ISO 670, ISO metadata, I've forgotten the, but this is published by Linz, so we've brought that in, you can download that. But also, um, in this particular case, I haven't got all the web services hooked up, but we could hook up the Linz base map service that allows us to pull this information through. Or um, we can also download, so for example, we could download the original GeoTIFF or, or a JPEG file. So further down here, we've got a couple of things here. First is this is telling us that it belongs to a collection. If you remember that, if you remember that um, scheme that I set up before, you know we had collections and things like this. So this allows us, we for example, can click on that and it goes back and lists every map in that collection. And the collection in this case is the NZ Topo 50 um, series. So also allows you to go, hey, this map is not the current map, and there should be a nice little message up there. Um, it's not the current edition. And we can step through, and and you know this has been replaced by, and then go through that, and we can go. Now I don't actually, strange enough, have the current edition. I need to talk to Linz about that because, um, um, and the reason for that is taking a step back. Sorry, I'm going to change gears. Taking a step back, the University of Auckland put together this fantastic geodata hub, and. Um, um, and that was Eagle. Eagle drove that for about ten years. But uh, when he left in 2018, all all data moving into that hub has stopped. So there's a gap. If you want to find the Linz non-current Linz table editions, um, I've got them on a hard drive, but they're not uh, available. So I need to load them up into. And that was one of the reasons that, that drove um, this idea for Land Information New Zealand. 
on there. Um, again, as you can see here, we can do different searches, faceted searches and things like that. Um, you can see a little little issue I've got, which I'm working on, is it doesn't support um, UTF-8. There is a, a fix, I just didn't get around to doing the fix, so we can fix um, that up. Um, and it also allows you to link to more details, so this links to the LINS website, so you can get more information um, on that map. So it's not only maps, you can, um, uh, for example, let me go to one of the portals in the US. You can do, you can do any sort of geospatial data, whether it's vector or, or raster. So what the big, what's called the Big Ten, so that's a combination of I think 12 universities in, in the US, have put together a, a slightly customized version where they can manage their maps. Um, and also um, manage um, imagery of course, vector data. And again, um, in the same sort of philosophy of using um, that, 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 that metadata schema to um, come through and, and um, pull, all that, pull all that data together. Um, so what else did I have here? Um, so um, one of the other things about this, so if you have Geo Blacklight, but then um, someone's gone ahead and created what's an admin portal, and this allows for the non-developers like myself who can't really write the code to automatically generate all these JSON files, but we can bring in via a spreadsheet or something like that. So we can bring in data and things through basically a, a spreadsheet and import it into the, um, in, into the um, application. How am I going for time? Oh, is it question time, is it? Whenever you're ready. Oh, yeah, I've got, um, okay, we're looking pretty good. So um, I'll talk very quickly about harvesting. So this is a really important part of it, is, is writing scripts to harvest and, and pull data. Um, so I've written scripts, I've, uh, I say, scrape, pull the metadata from about 460 different libraries or archives around the world. Um, of that, we've indexed about 1.6 million separate map sheets uh, around the world. So hopefully in the, in the next few months, we'll get all that loaded in and, and, and get that using. But again, that, that harvesting is a really important part because not only are you harvesting to, to get data in the first place, but, but updating data as well and, and continue running these little robots that, that head off into different servers and things like that. One thing I want to talk about really quickly, if I've got time, was the, so Linz have got a stack API. So stack is a spatial, temporal, something catalog. Um, but they've listed all their imagery over the last 20, 25 years. So written a quick FME script that's, that's pulled all the collections, created GeoJSON files for the indexes of all the images, and pulled that in to, so you can search through that, through this, um, through this um, platform. Um, also created thumbnails because Linz is really thinking ahead about these formats. They're using um, cloud-optimized GeoTIFFs, COGS, so it's quite easy to um, be able to create the thumbnails by just using a bit of code and FME to um, do that. And that's just an example of some of the some of the libraries that have got really large map collections um, that we've been pulling um, data from. Problems to solve. We can't view um, COGS within the platform yet, so that's just a leaflet issue. We've got to resolve that. Um, I'm talking about IIF, I've set up an IIF server using S3, so you just drag and drop S3, and then it just it just publishes directly, so that's working well. Further, further stack support, update the base maps. At the moment, it's just using a basic base map. Um, sort the Unicode UTF support out. QGIS plugin to be able to do that search things within QGIS. Um, search engine integration, so again, to allow a, a greater way for people to be able to find that, that stuff, streamline the uh, index creation and um, automated harvesting. I must be pretty much on time, am I? You are. Perfect. I'll leave that as, as questions. All right, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Greg. Um, questions? Hi. Um, so you Hang on the one second. Oh, yep. Get a mic. <coughs> it gets through into the recording.
Um, so you mentioned uh, one of the challenges you're facing is going to, you know, uh, map catalog all in Spanish, sitting behind a locked portal. Um, have you uh, considered the language aspect and making sure that everything is going to be that anyone from any language is able to use this in the future so that it doesn't create another barrier for the people? With the so that's Spanish a really good, that's really good, find it. really good question because being a, being a Kiwi, I speak one language basically. And so it's frustrating, yes. And, and if you look back at that schema, there's, there's an opportunity in that schema to add multiple languages for that search in there. And I think that's going to be really important. I'm going to focus on English just for now because that's what I know. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. but absolutely, particularly, you know, here in New Zealand, the, uh, next would be Maori for the, for the, for the Lynn stuff. But, uh, um, you know, as we go further afield, um, I think Spanish and French would be the, the next big ones and probably some of the Pacific languages, I think, again, because it's part of coming back into the thing. But I think that's a really good observation. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Greg.